Hello and welcome to the Shift Book Club. I'm journalist and author Sam Baker and I'm really delighted to be here with Nikki May, author of Wahala. Born in Bristol and brought up, in fact, here's Wahala, in case you haven't seen it here, rather beautiful paperback cover. I love it. I really, I want to talk to you about the covers later, but I love oh. this cover. It's really cool. Um, born in Bristol and brought up in Lagos, Nikki dropped out of medical school at 20, much to her dad's horror. And I love how you actually made that face then, that like, <laughs> oh, oh God, my dad's still going to kill me now yep. in my 50s. Still feel like a failure. <laughs> oh, no. Surely he doesn't think that now. No, he's probably changed his mind now, he says. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big of him. <laughs> She ran away to London, where she built a successful career in advertising before turning her hand to fiction. Her debut novel, Wahala, about family, food, friendship and identity, was the subject of a nine-way auction in the UK and a six-way auction in the States. And it's also being adapted for TV by screenwriter Teresa Ikoko, who was like, oh, that face, I know, how exciting. So much to talk about already, and I haven't even read the first paragraph. Who was BAFTA nominated for Rocks. Wahala, which means trouble, is a novel about three long-term friends, Ronki, Simi and Boo, and what happens when a heat-seeking revenge missile in the form of Isabel re-enters their lives. It's been variously described as a brown sex in the city, as if the other black girl strolled into sex in the city. Sex in the city with murder. I mean, all the sex in the city, <laughs> basically. Um, but I actually, you know, I'm I'm not knocking a sex city comparison, but I personally prefer comparisons to Big Little Lies. I'm a big Leanne Moriarty fan and I know you are. But it's like the characters and their lives are as pivotal, if not more so, the crime that's about to be committed. I think the characters got real depth and I think that's where the, co- the comparison with Leanne Moriarty is. So anyway, if you think none of that sounds like a barrel of laughs, you'd be wrong because Wahala won Nikki the Comedy Women in Print Newcomer Award. Uh, welcome, Nikki. Newcomer in your 50s. How does that feel? I uh, know, 58, scraped in before I got my bus pass. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it took a lifetime to get to the stage where I could write the book. So an overnight success that was a lifetime in the making, I think. Oh, I really want to talk to you about that kind of whole career shift that you made, because I think all of the people who are members of the shift will be like, that's that's what I want. I want to do that. But before we do, you're going to give us a little reading. So oh. over to you. Glasses on. I'm going to read from the beginning. The book is, it's sort of a carousel of characters. So you get Ronka Simi Boo. And because I've got mild OCD, I had to write in a carousel, Ronka Simi Boo, Ronka Simi Boo. But this is from the very <laughs> beginning. Pounded yam in a gussy. Eba with okra. No, it had to be pounded yam, but maybe with F or Eero. Ronka ran through the menu in her head as she walked up the hill to Booker. She knew it by heart, but that didn't make choosing any easier. As usual, she wanted it all. And as usual, she was running late. She stopped at the cash point anyway and withdrew a hundred pounds. The girls teased her, told it was an urban myth. But ever since Ronke heard the story about Simi's cousin's friend getting her card cloned at Booker, she'd paid in cash. Ronke had been looking forward to their Niger lunch all week and not just because of the food. For the first time in ages, when Simi asked, so what's new? The answer wouldn't be nothing. She hustled past the Sainsbury's local, the Turkish grocery and the Thai nail bar. The Nigerian flag outside Booker was looking a little tatty, frayed at the edges. The green was still vibrant, but the white a dirty beige. Ronke studied her reflection in the shiny mirrored door, yanked at her hair to fluff up some of the curls, patted to flatten some down. As good as it gets. At least once a day, someone said to her, I wish I had curly hair. But Ronka knew better. Curls meant frizz, knots and chaos. She pushed open the door and stepped out of suburban London and into downtown Lagos. The smell hit her first. Smoky burned palm oil, fried peppers, musty stockfish. Next came the noise. Fella Cutty blared out of the speakers, struggling to compete with the group of three men at a corner table talking over each other. Their vo- because this was effectively Nigeria, their voices were louder, accents stronger, gesticulations wilder. The waiter looked up with a scowl. As Ronke turned to shut the door, she knew his eyes would linger on her ass. It felt like home. 
She spotted Simi straight away, deep in conversation with the striking woman and felt a spike of irritation. Just us two, Simi had said. The stranger had long toned limbs and glossy brown skin. She looked almost sculpted. Something about her profile was familiar and for one heartbeat, Ronke was sure she knew her from somewhere. She blinked and the feeling disappeared. She didn't know anyone who had who showed side boob at lunch or had such an over the top blonde weave. I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, we bet. Throwing us straight in for Isabel. Oh, I hardly know where to start with the question, but I think maybe let's start with where did it? I mean, I I already know where the idea came from, but where did it? I mean, you can really tell where it came from once you know. But where did it? Where did it for this book first enter your head? Well, I, I always wanted to write a book. I mean, I think I started reading a book a week when I was about 10 and I've always wanted to write one. And one of the reasons we moved to Dorset was because I'd have so much time on my hands without commuting that this book would fly out of me. It didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but one day I was in London having lunch with friends at a restaurant that's a bit similar to the one in the opening chapter. And as I boarded the slow train home from Waterloo to Kruken, I almost felt myself shift out of Nigerian me into English me. At lunch, we've mm -hmm. been, it, we have shorthand, so we can talk about generator parts in Nigeria and about Ashawebi and about ethnic food in the same breath of talking about focaccia recipes or ski holidays. And as I got on the train and the conductor asked for my ticket, it was almost like a mental shift into, hi, I'm English Nikki again, and not that half Nigerian person who was in the restaurant. And I started thinking about my two cultures and how sometimes my sense of identity is really concrete and sometimes it's elusive and how being mixed is a bit of a mixed bag. And I thought there's enough background in this for a story. There's enough texture there for a story. And plot came a lot later. But on that train, I sketched out the first chapter, the first scene set in the restaurant with these friends having a loud, loud lunch with lots of wine. And surprisingly, because books get so much editing, I can't count how many times this book was edited. But oh, that bet. opening scene is so similar to the one I wrote on that train. So sometimes you just need a catalyst and that long drunk lunch was mine. And was Isabel in that scene right from she, the beginning? She was. She was very much so. I, I like a oh, lot of drama in my drama. So I knew I wanted it to have this sort of, I'd been watching Killing Eve and I think Villanelle <sighs> was very much alive and well in my head at the time. And I loved her wardrobe and her beauty and her glamour. So I think I didn't know exactly what Isabel was going to do, but I knew she was going to propel the narrative from the very get-go. That's so interesting. And were you um, also inspired? I bought, wanted to ask you this last time we did an event, but we, but I completely forgot. Were you also inspired by My Sister, the Serial Killer? I love that book. One of the so problems, good, isn't it? It's so stunning. One of the problems of being a Nigerian or half Nigerian want-to-be writer is we have such brilliant writers. I mean, we have Chimamanda and Gozia Adichie. You've got Oyinko Braithwaite with my sister. And then you've got greats like Wale Shoyinka. And it actually can be quite off-putting because you think, well, have mm. I got to contribute to this canon? You know, I've just got this silly little fun book. So yes, I, I did love that book. I think she's exceptionally clever. She just needs to be more prolific I know she's really got to write something else hasn't she yeah. that was that feels like when was it like I don't know be six two years. years before this the yeah. six years ago it's got to be sort of I think so and it's such a little book because I don't often read novellas but it packs everything in doesn't it it's a perfectly mm. sized book yeah I mean if you're listening and you haven't um, read it you really must it's yeah, so so, so, so good, good. And I think one and of the book reasons... her long listed, which is usually a big no for me, but yeah, no, normally she puts me it. right off. Yeah. yeah, that was a bit of um, it, it was a bit unusual for them because, Very. like you say, they don't normally um, certainly don't normally shortlist books that look like fun. No, not readable books. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, I kind of feel like it was well, that was one of the first ones that was actually, you know, it did serious issues, but it was just also funny and clever and irreverent before we talk some more about your characters I want to talk about you go back to talking about you for a bit because you have 
like you just said it really dismissively like oh yeah then we moved to Devon and then I didn't write a book um but but tell me about that because you came to London like you ran away from your dad when you were 20 I mean I know that makes it sound more serious than it was um and went into advertising so tell me about that what happened and how you came to then leave it again I mean it really was quite traumatic at the time I was I came to England I literally ran away from home and it was very much my dad thought by cutting me off he'd sort of bully me back to university in so Lagos. he cut you off rather than but, you yeah totally was... it was kind oh, of God. if you don't go back you're on your own and thought fine came to London and got a job t- with office angels temping and you go to me too <laughs> <laughs> I loved it I was in this grotty bed sit um temping doing different things every week having the time of my life and happened to end up temping in this ad agency Wonderman worldwide in um London and just loved it and I think I I really believe in serendipity and things happening at the right time and it just so happened that my boss and all his team were off on a long lunch this was the days when long lunches were a huge part Mm. of advertising one of the reasons I loved it and a client phoned up and instead of just taking a message, I tried to sort out the problem. And my boss, who is still one of my best friends now, was so impressed. He's like, you've got to work in advertising. You're an ad shop. It's like, all right, then. It means I don't have to tempt for a bit. I'll have a proper job. And that was it. I just found my forte. Absolutely loved it. Worked um, for about eight years and then set up our own agency with my then boyfriend, now husband, who was um, creative director. And bloody hard work I mean you work really really hard you play really hard and we it running your own agency is really difficult you have all the stress of doing all the work plus having and um, staff plus looking after clients it just became juggling too much and we actually moved to Dorset for our own sanity it was kind of if we keep doing this we're just going to get divorced and burn mm-hmm. up So moved, but still managed to hang on to our clients in a kind of consulting way and having a lot more fun with it. Working from home before working from home was actually invented. And I think uh, this serendipity thing happened again because it was a really small agency. I ended up doing writing lots of copy, which wasn't my brief. I was a suit. I was a client handler, but loved writing copy. Absolutely really enjoyed it. So I wrote books on mindfulness for Weight Watchers. I wrote books on how I receive for EMI and love the writing bit. And when I started writing the book, when I had after this train journey, when I got home, I actually approached it as if it was an advertising brief. And the thing I wrote mm. on my wall was write a brown, big little lies. And that was what was- Wow, up. really? Yeah. That was, I, amazing, I adore Leanne. And I think very few TV series live up to the book, but big little lies mm. I think does. So that was up there, write a brown, big little lies. And I love that aspiration as well. I quite like books. I mean, I do read Mislit, but I quite like books where you're properly escaping into successful, sassy women living their best lives. So that's what I wanted to do. And it was it just worked out the right time because I'd also really got tired of advertising. Your clients get younger and younger and younger and you're doing the same thing Mm. over and over again. So it was just perfect timing. So sorry, I've just got left some money. There we go. So how long did that take once you had sat on the train and gone, right, here are these women, here, this is this is the premise of Wahala, what was the time span like after that? So the first draft I think took about six months, I was still working at the time but working for myself and from home and it literally poured out of me, I spent a lot of time developing the characters, I had the most ridiculous spreadsheet where I had asked all these questions about these characters so that I could really differentiate them because is that uh, an ad industry thing it totally is I love that kind of yeah who is your uh, when you have to build uh been quite clear I've been quite clear oh hang on Charlie I'm just gonna turn you off there we go Sorry, Nikki, I'm back now. That's okay. So it's almost that brief thing. Get your brief really clear. So I had to know Ronka, Simi and Boo inside out. Mm. And I had to, I wanted them to be really believe, I needed to actually believe in them as real people. So I needed to know things about mm. them that would never turn up in the book. Did they keep their ketchup in the fridge or in a cupboard? Where Who did they mm-hmm. first kiss? You know, just things that were so irrelevant and that nobody would care about, but mattered to me. 
So spent a couple of months at least just working on that, just on character building until these women were fully fledged, walking around in my head, annoying the hell out of me. And then wrote the book. I did have a plot. I did know where I was going to go. I did know what the story was meant to be. Wrote it, um, printed it out, lots of paper read it back and it was absolutely awful it was <laughs> it was dire and this is the first book I've written so I didn't realize at this point that first drafts are supposed to be complete shit I thought god you really have failed at this put it in a drawer wished I hadn't told anyone what I was doing because there were the inevitable questions what's happening with that book then and mm. just saying oh nothing it's fine and in actual fact, again, it was one of the best things I did because by putting it away and not thinking about it or worrying about it rather than doing anything with it, I the ideas were just taking shape in my head and I got to the stage where I knew what I needed to do. What I'd been too scared to do when I was writing is I needed to actually show these, give these women hell. It was almost what's the worst thing you can do to each of them, do it. And I, I wouldn't say I'm a complete bitch, but I do have bitchy moments. It was quite yeah. fun wrecking havoc and actually making these girls' lives absolute hell. Also, I work with my partner. He's my husband and he was my creative director. And we were always a team and we tend to get the best out of each other by arguing. So we'd have these huge arguments about, no, she wouldn't do that. Yes, she would. And he really helped me turn it into an actual story rather than just. A... Oh, wow. And you're still married. Still amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so what stage did he get involved then? What stage did he do? So he, did you read the first draft? Did he you let him get involved before draft. that? No, he read the first draft and I thought it was a pretty shitty draft, but he turned around and said, this isn't what you said you're going to write. Nothing happens. They just go for lunch and gossip. And <laughs> it's like, okay, all right, I know. Um, and he's, he reads a lot of fantasy and I think if he had his way, they'd probably have turned into zombies. So they're working to have to <laughs> oh, say, great. no, this is not happening. I also have this tendency when I write to start the scenes way too early. So I have to have mm. them arriving and saying hello and having a cup of tea and all of, so I overwrite terribly. It's such a waste of time. I reckon 50% of what I write has to go in the bin, but I, I can't not do it that way. I have to, my first three hours of work are a waste. I have to sit there getting them to where they need to be before it can happen. I think that's like a, a learning thing though. It's like when you, I'm trying to remember when I wrote my first one, I remembered like having this character just like, oh, they were always like either in the bath or getting a bath or making a plan to do something and not doing it. It's just like, no, nobody cares. Yeah, just exactly. do it. If there's a bit of detail about the doing that was needed, you can put that in later. But yeah. it's just not, I just don't think, I mean, I don't, I mean, I was a journalist, so it's, a, it's almost the opposite of journalism. Yeah, yeah. I think the other thing that helped with advertising is being used to be edited. So I'm used to my best ideas yeah. being killed by a client. I'm used to the client <laughs> ruining my copy. I'm used to, so I think, and I think that's a really good thing. So you don't take it personally, or if you do, you sulk for about 10 minutes and then get on with it. So I'm really, I wouldn't say I love being edited, but I'm used to it. And I do realise that you have to go through iterations to make something good. Yeah, you don't take it personally. Not always. <laughs> <laughs> So how how did you get from this crappy first draft, your in your opinion, um, to you know a nine way auction because that like doesn't happen every day of the week. Well, the other thing is being a debut is I didn't know this didn't happen. So to me, it was all perfectly normal and this was standard. I was like, why do people make out so hard? It's not. So I, I did unpick it. I did work really hard. And as I say, I looked at it as a job rather than a passion project. It was very much I'm writing because I want to get published. I took it very seriously. I read lots of books. I always have. But I kind of reading is, I think, the best way to learn how to write. And I read some really mm. brilliant books like Kate Atkinson, who I adore, and, mm. you know, really understanding things at sentence level. And then I read some really shit books. I won't tell you which ones they are because oh. they make you feel better about yourself. And you think, look, if that got published, then you stand a chance of I mean, it's obviously <laughs> subjective. My idea of a shit book is probably someone else's best ever. So there was a lot. I think I spent two years in total 
well, over a two year period working on it for six months, then three months, then another three months until I felt, you know, this is not terrible. And then entered a few these amateur competitions like the Yeovil Literary Prize, the Blue Pencil Prize. You pay 30 quid, you send them three chapters, you cross your fingers and got shortlisted, long listed and then won one of them where the judge was an agent. And she said, please, can I see it? And obviously, as a want-to-be writer, you stalked Twitter, you stalked agents, you you understand the system. And I thought, well, if one agent wants to see it, send it to six, tell them you've already had a request for the full, which kind of, I'm a marketer, so I knew that. I was going to say, of... that's really your advertising background speaking. Yeah, yeah, so you're kind of improving your stock. And then I got six agent off- offers in a week, and this was just Amazing. before lockdown, so went to London to meet them and um, picked an agent, did some more editing. And then it was honestly, I think sometimes there's right place, right time. I think sometimes you just, I think a lot of black books are very about trauma and about, um, you know, suffering. And I I think this felt fresh at the time because you've got these three women who were very successful. You know, they're wearing designer clothes, they're going for nice lunches, they're not maids, they're not. So yes, there's casual racism and there's stuff like that. But to be honest, they just brushed it off. It wasn't a story about oppression. It wasn't mm. a story about being under the cosh. And I think that did sort of feel, which is really sad, the fact that a a book about regular black women feels unusual is actually very depressing. Mm. But I think it actually did. And it was sort of, oh my God, this isn't, you know, a a book that just happens to have black people in it rather than a book that's about being black. Yeah. Which of course is my experience. You know, my mom's white, my dad's Nigerian. I've lived in both countries I don't wake up in the morning looking in the mirror thinking I'm black. I just wake up thinking I'm Nikki and getting on with my life. And that's the story I wrote for these women. Whereas I do honestly think too much, too many books by black people are about being black rather than being a person. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that, I mean, thinking of one particular writer who her first book, um, she's a woman of colour and her first book was phenomenally successful and it was about you know it was in the territory where publishers thought she should be writing and then her next three or four books did like virtually nothing and then the next book she wrote that was in the territory where publishers thought she should and again that became successful and it's a bit like you know I mean you didn't make it easy for yourself because you didn't do that you wrote a book about people you know, yeah, not about the black that experience. That was the real thing, of people wanting you in your lane. Yes, they want you to stay in your lane, but also you committed, like, the cardinal sin of writing across genres, yes. which no real person knows or cares. But exactly. in, within publishing, I they literally... They can't cope if you go, you've written, a, basically, a kind of a thriller and a kind of a female drama. French, yeah. And funny. And so, yeah. oh, my God, is it funny? Is it... You know, is it a drama? Is yeah. it crime? Where do the bookshop put it? Exactly. Which so I find, I still find this really weird because I was, I've been okay. an avid reader and I've never been to a bookshop and say, I'm only looking at thrillers. I've been like, tell me what's good. You know, I do, there's some genres I don't, I'm not a huge fantasy reader, but, you know, psychological drama, bring it on. Crime, bring it on. Thriller, bring it, you know, it's kind of, I mm. read good books. And I do think most people are quite similar. But no, publishing don't like that. Yeah, well, for like this book club, we've done nonfiction, we've done, you know, literary fiction, we've done commercial fiction, we've done crime. Um, uh, we've got a dystopian thing coming up. Um, sorry, I haven't told you about that yet, guys. Um, I and love dystopia. At no I mean. point, at no point has anybody said, "Oh, well, I don't read, I don't read nonfiction, or I don't read crime, or I don't." everybody's just been like yeah I'll give it a try yeah exactly exactly and you like what you like even this literary fiction versus commercial fiction thing I find really annoying and reductive but my new world yeah it's a world (laughs) um 
Uh, actually, I mean, before we go, I do want to talk to you about the characters and about friendship, but let's talk about the cover because that is kind of a bit relevant to what we, you know, what we've just been talking about. Because I haven't actually got the hardback here, but the hard, British hardback. Oh, you, uh, yeah, you this have. Not actually hardback, but this is a proof which has a very similar. The hardback's prettier; it's glossier, but this was yeah, bit... got more of like floral and yeah. stuff on it, hasn't it? So that's like quite serious and crimey looking yeah and then this which I absolutely love which is a bit kind of women's commercial fiction but really cool and a bit uh Bernadette you know Wedgwood yeah. Bernadette yeah. um and then the American cover I love my American paper <laughs> completely have you got one there yeah hang on one sec for everyone I just love I'd really like you to see it Oh gosh, but handfuls coming over. Just destroy my bookcase. So, my American what hardback are you looked like this. Yeah, so that is that a uh, Nigerian fabric print. Yeah, and then my American paperback, they got someone oh. to actually illustrate the four women. I love this one. It's an Irish illustrator, and these are supposed to be that's supposed to be Boo, that's Ronke. That's Simi and that's Isabel, theoretically. Oh, oh so they, they did a similar thing. They yeah. went for a more accessible. Oh, this wow, what's that? This is Czech. It's my Czech cover, which it's is crazy. so fascinating, isn't it? I, I love know. looking at people. It's different... amazing. It's so much fun. What do you, have you got a preference? Which, which of your covers do you like? Can you pick a favourite? I can't, to be honest. The other thing is, I, because I worked in advertising and because I was so annoyed with clients who thought they knew more about design than the art director or the designer, I mm. purposely just said, you're the expert, you know. So when I got the American cover, I thought, God, that doesn't say anything about my book, but my editor assured me that that was the right cover for their market. So I don't know. And also... I think you tend to think, so when I wasn't, to be honest, totally sure about this cover, but so many people love it that you think, yeah, it's great. I love it too. So I'm just really glad I've got loads of different covers. I did. I do love my very original because I do think it's quite iconic. I think it was very different from anything else that was on mm. the shelf at the time, but I'm not sure it was the right positioning for my book. It does to me have a bit of a crimey filler, but I did great in hardback. So who knows? I know nothing. Well, they but they were going for crime, weren't they? Because I yes. was first given a proof at Harrogate, yeah, which is a crime festival for yeah. everybody listening. Um, so that was that was kind of where they were at in their heads, I think, for the whole yeah. back. Yeah, and I don't think it's crime. I think it's got crime in it, but I wouldn't call it a crime book. No, it's like well, like we said at the beginning, it's like Le Leanne yeah. Moriarty. It's like Big so, Little Lies. It's about the women. And yeah, the, very character the, the crime is it's not incidental because it's important but it, it's not the reason really yeah. for the... so tell us some more about the characters because they are they're all striving yeah but they're all very different and they've all got kind of like hot topic issues going on in their lives so tell us a bit more about that so what they have in common is they're all mixed race and they're all Anglo-Nigerian, like me. And there's a little bit of me in all of them and there's a little bit of my friends in them. But they're three very different women. They they feel differently about race. They feel differently about place. So you've got Ronke. She's the nurturer. Everybody wants to be Ronke. All my friends say, you based Ronke on me, didn't you? It's like, no, you're Isabel. But Ronke's like the carer. <laughs> she loves food. She, she's very loving. She likes cooking for people. She's a really lovely person, um, except when it comes to her bad taste in men. So she's looking, she lost her father when she was 10. And she was that she then moved from Nigeria to England and she was kind of wrested away from home and happiness. And she's searching for this father fig for this husband who is a replica of her dead father. Um, and she's got a history of dating these dodgy Nigerian guys. I had that history too, so I know exactly what it's like. Yeah. And her friends all think she's always picking the wrong guy. She's seeing Kaya today, she's convinced he's the one. She wants 2.2 kids she wants happy ever after and she's convinced she's had it her friends think he's a bad one then you've got 
Simi. Simi's the golden one. Every she's got a great job. She's got a husband who works in banking, so she's got the Bank of Martin. She's got this gorgeous wardrobe, amazing figure, job in fashion, lovely flat. My husband, I, when I started dating my husband, he lived in that flat, so I know it perfectly. Oh, inside. nice work. <laughs> Very nice flat. So, um, but that nobody realised that she's crippled by imposter syndrome. So on the surface, she projects this golden, everything's great personality, but inside she's really um, confused and nervous. She's also a great liar. So her husband thinks they're trying for a baby. She's not. You've got Boo, who gets a lot of stick for readers, but is actually one of my favourite characters. She's, things look good. She's got a lovely husband, lovely kid, but she she's so unsure of who she is and where she belongs. So she never knew her father. He abandoned her mother before she was born, but he informed all her opinions about Nigerian men. And to me, it's very understandable because if you if you live here and if all you hear about Nigeria is on the news, you think it's a terrible place. It's poverty, it's corruption, it's, you know, bribery, it's poverty. It's just not great until we have somebody score a football who's Nigerian, but then they stop being Nigerian, they start being English as soon yeah. as they score for the team. Mm. So all her opinions about Nigeria are pretty negative. And the only link she has to them are these two friends. And then you get Isabel, who explodes into the friend group. She's rich and glamorous, and there are Nigerians who have untold wealth, usually by ill-gotten means. So she explodes into friendship, and at first it seems she's bringing out the best in everyone, but she's a wrecking ball, and the, the narrative is kind of propelled by what she's doing and why is she doing it. So you've got these three women. It's all set in London. It's also supposed to be a bit of a love story to London, I miss London. I lived there for 20 wonderful years and I li now live in the middle of nowhere where if I look out the window, I'll be lucky if I see a sheep. And I do <laughs> miss the dynamism. I miss the restaurants. I miss the people. And I do also miss that time in your life when friends were not that friends aren't important now but you saw them all the time you know it's like every Friday you're out with them every Saturday you're out with them every Sunday we're having brunch. So it was a kind of nostalgic nod to that time in my life which um, and that sort of buzziness of London at that time when you're not sure what you're doing, where friends are going in slightly different directions and you've got the ones who's bossing it at work and you've, one that's got, you've got the one who's bossing it in relationships. And you're kind of judging yourself by where do I stand compared to what my friends are doing. It's quite complicated being a woman and I wanted to throw all that messiness into the book. And it's there at that age as well, aren't they? They've been friends since university, but they're at that age when cracks do start to appear because, you know, the kind of the person who has kids, the person who wants kids but can't have them, the person who doesn't want, you know, all of those like wedges that society kind of uses against women. Yeah, so many um, expectations. You know, there's these, I think as women, we're just weighted down by expectations about everything, our looks, our careers, our relationship status, whether you want to have kids or not have kids. And I think because they're mixed race, when you refract that through that, that lens, things become even more complicated. I don't have kids and I never wanted them. But in Nigeria, that there's only two reasons you don't have a kid. One is that you're mad. The other is that you're barren. Well, there's a third reason, both. But, you know, it's sort of seen <laughs> yeah, as abhorrent that you couldn't want a child. You know, I can't, if you said it out loud, you'd be sort of, oh, my God, what is wrong with her? And I think I wanted to throw in those sorts of pressures, which even though you know they're stupid, they still weigh you down. So I did find it, it was better than therapy. I have to say writing a book is much <laughs> better and cheaper than therapy as a way of working through some of these issues, like dropping out of medical school, which I gave Simi. And it actually brought it all back and made me realize that even now a successful, independent woman, I still feel that sense of failure from a decision, like a good decision. I'd have been such a mm. shit doctor. People would have died. You know, it's so, I did the world a favor by dropping out. And yet I still up till recently felt a real sense of failure and of letting people down. So, you know, I was trying to iron through all these issues through my girls. I mean, Obviously, you weren't a failure, but no, you don't know that when you're inside it. But has your has the success of Wahala? I mean, first as a book, but also now, it's not only options by the BBC 
So I'll say that again. It's not only optioned by the BBC, but it's actually commissioned, isn't it? So it really, is going to yeah. really, really happen. It's not going to yeah. sit in someone's drawer. No, no, it's definitely happening. Is that successful enough for your dad? Oh, yeah, my dad's gone complete turnaround 360 degrees and always knew I'd be a better writer. And it's fine. I mean, we did. <laughs> of course, he, yeah. he did long before he, he, you know, we did bury the hatchet. And I love my dad. I went back. He had, we, and I went for my Nigerian book launch. He threw a huge party and bought copies for all his friends. And but I do I think it's also this because my dad was the first person in his family to go to university and came to England to study medicine and work like a Trojan to be able to do it you know he's working in the post office all weekend and nights to be able to afford so for him I can kind of understand that immigrant thing where you want mm. your kids to do better than you and there's I was thinking when Rishi Sunak today has basically said if you're not studying medicine or architecture you're basically you've got a Mickey Mouse degree it's this classic yeah. immigrant thing but you know yeah. unless you're and it's kind of you see it's the most Indian dad thing he could possibly have done yeah like he's just done he it. really is being full Indian dad yeah him. and it's kind of I can I can understand it. it doesn't make it right but I can understand it but what I think is really sad is how and I do think it's such a rich vein that, that fathers do come into the book quite a mm. lot the fathers are yeah. you know they've all got daddy issues haven't they, they all, all have I do think parents are I do think this thing about the stories you inherit and how your past can really creep up I think it's such a rich vein in real life and in fiction so why why daddies and not mummy issues read book two. <laughs> oh, you got that coming I've got mummy issues <laughs> I'm going to run out of issues. Yeah. Oh, no, you won't. Well, there's always more. <laughs> so now you've mentioned it, that have you had difficult second albums? In, uh, what's wrong with my mouth tonight? <laughs> difficult second album syndrome. Definitely. I definitely found book two a lot harder. I think that I always wondered why debuts were seen as this. People celebrate debuts. Publishers just go mad for debuts, you know, mm. and I just never understood it. It was like, if you're going for an operation, you don't say, right, I want the doctor who's never done an operation before. <laughs> First touch, just chuck a scalpel in his hand, let him, you just wouldn't do it. So why do publishing go mad for debuts? And it was only when I started struggling with my second book that I realised the, tr- the beauty of a debut is you're just writing for yourself. Obviously, you hope you'll be published. Obviously, you have dreams of being published, but you have all the time in the world. You have no pressure, no ticking clock, no expectation. But with book two, it's suddenly like, oh, will you make it funny like the first one? So I didn't think I was making it funny. I was just writing. Mm. And you suddenly know more because suddenly you've had this crash course in genre and in what's on trend and what isn't. So suddenly you've got all these things that start to affect how you're writing. Also, although you should never, ever read your Goodreads reviews, we all do. So, of course, you've read the... Oh, you don't, that you, way madness lies. Totally, oh. and all writers are half mad. So instead of focusing on the 95% of really good reviews, you tap into the few that are really negative, which then make you... It's not writer's block, it's just being afraid to just write. So you have to go through all of those. And I had to go through all of it with book two and almost get to the stage. I think the other thing is being older is such a joy and such. I don't I don't think I could have gone through this if I was much younger. It, the older you get, the fewer fucks you give. And mm. I, I still give too many. But, you know, mm. it's kind of being able to say, look, if I don't like it. I really don't care and that was it was reaching that stage of just write what you want to write write what you believe in and you've always got Peter my husband to tell you it's crap and to help beat it into shape and it's definitely definitely book two is a lot harder but there tell us a little bit about book two then apart from the mummy issues Okay, so I haven't actually, normally, I haven't actually got a pitch for it, but I knew you were going to ask me that. So I kind of had a think about yeah. what I would say about book two. And I'd probably describe it as Mansfield Park meets Beaches, two of my favourite. Oh, I love the book, yeah. I love the film. So yeah. you've got Franny Price has been recreated as Funke, who is growing up in Lagos, Fortunately, in the same house I grew up in, so I know the architecture perfectly. And she's got an English mum and a Nigerian dad, and life is good. They're living a nice middle-class life in Lagos. Tragedy strikes. Her mother and brother are killed in a car crash. 
her father falls apart. She's sent to Somerset to live with her, her mother's family in a house called The Ring. And she's a fish out of water. She has to learn how to adapt. And obviously being mixed, you run into class prejudice, a bit of racism and all that sort of thing. But at its heart, it's a story about, it's a love story between two cousins, Funke and her cousin Liv, who's very wild, mad spirited, and they become really close friends and almost like sisters. And it's a coming of age story about both of them, about place, about how mothers can really affect you. One's got a wonderful mother who happens to be dead. One's got a hideous mother who happens to be alive and how they navigate those. And it's really, I think what it's trying to see is whether love is the difference between surviving and thriving. But because I, I'm half Nigerian, it's got to have a few epic twists in it as well. It's a bit of revenge. So you have kept the kind of revenge thread. Yeah, from... I just like a bit of drama. Fair enough. No, I was just thinking though, in the, you know, weird Wahala, it's funny, it is, you know, you've crept out of your lane, it's, and you've got the revenge thread, you've got the friendship, but, you know, you've got all those things going, going on. And that, doing that the first time, when you didn't have like the reader sat over your shoulder and on that side and the editor that side, but then replicating all of those strands when you have to consciously do it, it's a whole different ball game, isn't it? It is. And I think there's also a temptation to rewrite the same book. I've read so many book twos, which is like a sort of not as good book ones. And I'm not saying my book two is as good or better, but it's certainly different. It is a completely... But publishers love that. Publishers does often ask for that. That's the... the same book again. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. So, And I was also really lucky in that nobody saw this agent publisher until it was finished. So I didn't have that sort of, this is looking good, but it was here it is, not done, because obviously you then get yeah, structural edits, edits and everything yeah. else, but a book I was relatively happy with. I've forgotten to ask you about food. I feel mm. remiss, because food is like, it's practically another character in Wahala. Yes. One of the is reviews that... said it's basically a long jollof rice recipe. He didn't mean it yeah. kindly, but I was like, yeah, I'll take it. I love it. <laughs> That's not true. I mean, there actually is a jollof rice recipe in it the is. back, which I really love the fact that you did that. Um, what is it? Are you a big foodie? I love food. I also love cookbooks. I've got probably 60, 70 cookbooks. And there's some cookbooks like Nigel Slater, Nigella Lawson, that I just read. I don't look, I just take them to bed and read them because they just write about food. In Food is just such an important part of life. It's also a very Nigerian thing, the whole nurturing, the whole you know, family, the whole sort of looking after people. And when I ran away to London, what I really, I did miss Nigerian food terribly and I couldn't cook, but I only learned to cook so that I could cook Nigerian food. That was about the only reason I learned to cook. And when we first, when we moved to Dorset, I used to drive to Bristol, which is an hour and a half, just to get Nigerian, just to get my scotch bonnets or my yam. Yeah. So yeah, love food. I also think that food, the way people treat food is such an interesting thing. So with Ronke, food for her is caring. It's all about sharing and about loving. With Simi, food is about control. So it's that thing of I don't eat carbs I don't eat uh, unless it's in wine you know that sort of using food as a way of controlling her body and with Boo food is just a nuisance she's got this five-year-old that she has to cook for and today she doesn't like broccoli and food to her is just a chore so I really like the way you can use food to sort of again set these characters apart and differentiate them and no, love it. I also loved Agatha Christie books as a kid and Enid Blyton, who I know is not, you're not allowed to like her anymore. But no, I, not anymore. No. <laughs> I grew up on Enid Blyton and I remember things of reading about jam sandwiches before I knew what jam was and tongue sandwiches <laughs> and thinking, oh my God, tongue, can people actually eat that? So I think, I think no. food is just such a no, lovely I way. No. I know, it was the thought of it was just That's vile. It. I remember clutching my tongue in my mouth as I read them, thinking, why? And even things like lashings of ginger beer, I couldn't understand how food could come in lashings, because in Nigeria, lashings was about getting it's, smacked yeah. in school with a cane. So I do think food is such a wonderful way of showing different cultures. So, yeah, slightly obsessed. Yeah. 
I should just say to everybody, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat box and I, I will ask them, ask Nikki them in a minute. If not, I'll just keep, I'll just keep going. Um, uh, stru structurally, you gave yourself a bit of a hard job, didn't you, in terms of those Definitely. three, three points of view. Um, and like you said, you're a bit like OCD about it. So everything has to be like one, two, three, one, two, three, and color coded. Um, did you, well, you, I guess it was the debut and you didn't, you didn't realize the challenge that you were setting for yourself during that. No, I didn't know your prologues are not meant to have, you definitely, three points of view is too, too many. I didn't know any of these things. And so a lot oh, of it was- opinion. Exactly. It's totally opinions. And I find some of these opinions are ridiculous. I mean, who bought a book and said, I'm not reading that because it's got a prologue? Nobody, ever. You know, if it works, that's it works. so weird. I mean, loads of books have prologues. Exactly. And that's exactly. Particularly crime. I, I do think one of the things that can actually hamper you, I've got loads of books on how to write books and- mm. I think the more you read them, the more I struggle to write because you suddenly are so aware of what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. And yes, there are rules. I mean, you don't want to head hop and you want to have this, you don't want to go from um, present tense to past tense in the same sentence. But they're such simple rules. And if you just read mm. a few fiction books or nonfiction books, you'll realize why those rules are there. So luckily I didn't know anything. So to me, the, for me, what was annoying about three points of view is it meant that you, you you couldn't just decide, right, this is happening now because it had to happen. It had to unfold in, you know, Ronka, Simi, Boo had to have their chapters and you had to make sure that remembering what they knew and what they didn't know was bloody difficult. Mm. It was like, does she realise that yet? Does she not? But no, I couldn't have told the story any other way. And sometimes I think you just have to tell the story you can tell the way you can tell it. And if people like it, great. If they don't, tough. Were you tempted to give um, Isabella Strand? No, but in the, I think it's in the paperback, she does have a chapter right at the end. She finally yeah. gets her say, I think, yeah, the, there's a bonus scene in the paperback. But no, and to be honest, if we knew what Isabel was thinking, it would be plots, it's spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler yeah. alert. Yeah. So no, and and I think because she is that sort of, in my head, this villanelle character, what was to me, and I do know a few people like that, what was clever about Isabel is she could be different things to different people. And she was one of those, she would just give you the face that she knew you wanted to hear and the face that would get the best out of you. And I've definitely met people like that in my life. Oh, so many. But I mean, you've worked in advertising and I've worked in media and it's absolutely riddled with yeah. them both yeah. of those industries yeah it's horrible <laughs> have you got an isabelle-esque character in the next one no not no i haven't um but there are some not very nice people in it but no not in isabelle it's um i don't know if it's a softer book i think it's it's a more it's slightly more serious book i think not intentionally, it just turned out that way, but hopefully bits of it are funny. And what I didn't do, I think I just like giving myself trouble because what I've done, this book is set over almost a 20 year period, which makes life a lot harder. I didn't intend, I did, definitely didn't want to write a saga. I, I don't actually like reading sagas, but somehow I've managed to have a book that spans 20 years, which, so it's almost like a coming of age thing. Mm. But no, there isn't an Isabel, but there's quite a bit of fashion, not as much food. I managed to not put quite as much food into it. They don't spend all day eating. <laughs> but it does traipse around. It traipses around time and around place. So a lot of this book is set in Nigeria. It's almost half set in Nigeria, half set here. Have you, have you got a monster spreadsheet? No, I haven't got any spreadsheets for this book, which is frightening. Oh no God. spreadsheet at all. And these two characters were always, I never felt the need to keep them apart because they are so different. Liv and Funke are such different characters. Anna's now walking around my head, which is a good thing because it means I've got rid of Boo, Ronka and Simi. So I've got some questions for you. Um, we've been talking about Isabel, so let's carry on. Uh, Laurie is asking, were the scenes um, from Isabel's perspective part of what you cut? Or did you write scenes from her perspective just for yourself? 
I didn't write them, but I did try to really understand her motivation. So I sort of did lots of thinking about what is she thinking? Why is she doing this? How is she doing this? And so I could really understand what she was doing. And I did, there's a lot of dialogue that got cut, which was Isabel dialogue. So it, it for me, it's really important that I believe the story. If I've got, if I'm trying to make you believe it, then I've got to believe it. So there was a lot of, no, she wouldn't do that. And no, that wouldn't make sense. There's a lot of working it out and trying to make sure that her motivations felt real. And she had her own spreadsheet as well. So, you know, all you knew all the same detail about her as the others. Absolutely. Of course, being a psychopath, you couldn't really trust her answers. But yes, she no, yeah. <laughs> is that really her star sign? Well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jane has asked, do bonus chapters get added to paperbacks often? I don't know. It was my American editor who came up with it. She really liked the idea of having a bonus. Um, and it was actually, it was, I wrote it probably nine, a year after I'd finished the book. So it felt really weird. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. But in the end, I actually loved doing it. It was nice to go back into the world of my girls. And because Isabel, who is, I mean, she's a very over the top character. And some people have said she's too over the top. But I assure you, we have some people in Nigeria. Well, it's not just Nigeria now. Corruption is quite an international thing now. I can't work out where I am based on how corrupt the government is because they're all basically no. terrible. But we have some people who are just so wealthy. I mean, just ridiculous amounts of wealth. And it was actually quite fun to write a character that was like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the go back to the. I think the bonus material thing is becoming quite a thing. So sometimes it's like publishers put in book club questions, don't yeah. they? Or I just finished reading tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Oh, I've just, I finished that last week. Oh, it's so good, isn't it? It's is brilliant. So good. So, did you read the paperback? Yes. So, at the end of the paperback, there's um actually notes from her when she was working on it so it's oh, not it's not a bonus chapter but it's literally like pictures of her notebook oh it's I didn't get I read it on Kindle so I didn't but what um, I loved I love that book to me it was almost like a little life written by Taylor Jenkins Reid it had that what a great you know what I mean and, yeah. I was, and my husband saying what's it what's it like what's it last and it's as if Taylor Jenkins Reid has rewritten a little life but completely different and I'm not remotely a gamer but I just I loved it yeah. she's very clever yeah, I mean, somebody, in fact, when I did get sent uh, a proof, you know, a few years ago, I just like shoved it on the pile and I was like, yeah. I don't want to read a book about computer games. Yeah. Anyway, we should be talking about you, Sorry. not about yeah. her. Sorry, no, that's my fault. <laughs> um, Jane has asked, do you write, do you still write ad copy and your books? No, I don't do ad copy. I just write books. But no, I don't just write books. I write books, but I also walk my dogs and procrastinate and read cookbooks and watch too much telly. But no, no more advertising. Yeah. <laughs> what are you watching on telly? We're watching Blue Line. It's this really, really good. It's sort of like the, um, it's Happy Valley, but in Ireland. I'm only on episode two and absolutely loving it. Oh. And then it's really good. It's very Happy Valley-ish. It's oh, absolutely I think it's called Blue Line or Thin Blue Line or something like that. And I've made the mistake of watching Walking Dead, which is just terrible. It's just vampires killing each other, not vampires, zombies killing zombies, each other over, yeah. over and over again. But I'm addicted now and I have to know what happens. And unfortunately, there's like 12 seasons. So I'll be doing that for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> Jane wants to know if that's your dogs in the background on the blog. Yes, that's Fella and Lola. Fella's the big one and Lola's the evil one. But yeah, those are my two schnauzers, standard yeah. schnauzers. Earlier you said you really like dystopian fiction. Get what's oh, your fave? Yeah. It has to be Station Eleven. Absolutely uh, adore so good. that book. Absolutely. I've read it, I think, five times and I'll probably read it five more. Absolutely love it. But I recently watched Pedro in this film, The Last of Us. It's Netflix. Oh, yeah. It's so good. It's brilliant. Aww. But I'm a huge dystopian fan. The other book I really like is called Last One at the Party by Bethany Clift. And it came out a couple of years ago and didn't do as well as it should have because I think dystopia in pandemics 
didn't really match but it's Bad really plan, yeah. really funny and the best bit about it which is what I would do is if you were the last woman on earth what would you do and I would go to Soho farmhouse and that's what this person does and she's like chilling out in the jacuzzi at Soho farmhouse drinking the bar which is exactly <laughs> what I would do so I found that quite funny so start seeing if anybody else managed yeah, to survive you know, it's a fun, yeah. there. <laughs> and but, anybody there's time for one or two more questions if you've got one no pressure if you haven't um what are you reading right now right now I'm reading my own book too because I'm getting oh, line good. edits any time so I'm reading that at the minute and it's right doing kindle highlighting a kindle notes which is really horrible because it's like I'm trying to read it as a book but of course you don't yeah. you're like no this bit's wrong and no this bit's wrong so yeah. that's what I'm reading at the moment but I'm also judging the Cheshire book prize so I'm reading the short list for that which is 10 books that I'm reading and I've got three more days so I better crack on oh god yeah that's a job um, how's the casting coming on on the Haven't BBC started casting series? Yeah, I think we start casting in a couple of months and it's going to be horrible because I know exactly what these women look like. I know, mm. you know, to me, they are, they are just walking around in my head. I know what they look like. I know what they sound like. And of course, they're not going to sound like that. And the other thing about TV is you don't get to say, I mean, they're being really collaborative and really like, what do you think, Nikki? But you know, the honest answer is, we're going to do what we want to do and so they should because they're the experts and so hopefully but the good thing is if it's fantastic I shall get all the glory and if it's terrible I shall say it's nothing to do with me so it's a kind yeah. of win-win situation whatever happens and honestly the thought that a book I've written is going to end up on the BBC is just it's crazy Oh, it's and it's going to be true. a mega slot as well, isn't it? Like Sunday Apparently, night it's like Sunday nine o'clock. And the my the producer Liz Kilgariff, she did Bodyguard, she did Luther, she did The Cry. I mean, she is just brilliant, and she really gets it. So I'm, I, I it's it's just it's honestly dream come true. Pinch me. And I still, until we, I don't often think about it. So it's when they talk about it, I just think, shit, this is really happening. I think. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Because like you said, you always wanted to write a novel and you made that happen in your mid-50s, but it's like you and Bonnie Garmer are I like, know. they're giving Bonnie, everybody hope. You know, and and like, we're the yeah. same editor, the same publicist, you know, like me. Oh, of course you are. Yeah, yeah. we're both Doubleday, we're both Jane Lawson, we're both Alison Barry. It's crazy. And she's so lovely and so humble. We both were shortlisted for the comedy women in print thing and I met her there. She's just having, I mean, she's just a superstar and deserves it. She is incredible. But yeah, old women. Well, I don't feel old. That's the other thing. In my head, I'm I, not you know, old. So, but there is this thing of, oh, these two old women writing books. I don't feel remotely old. I feel I'm at living the, my best life and at the best of it. So old is Who the Who said thing. these two old women? <laughs> not old. That's like, you know, that, oh, that makes me mad. <laughs> me too. Oh, well, it's been so, I've loved talking to you. It's so brilliant. And it makes me realise how last time um, Nikki and I did an event together at Cheltenham, it was about friendship. And she had to st share the stage with um, these two blokes, one poet who, he was really, he's a lovely guy, but he just wanted to you know, like, do loads and loads of reading. Um, and you did wipe the floor with both of them, but we <laughs> didn't need them. We could have easily we filled that time on our own. Yeah, it was a lovely event, though. It was good fun. It was really fun. Um, Just before we go, everybody, it's just going to go next week, not next week, next month's book club. You probably already know, but just in case you missed the email, it's The Witching Tide. Um, and I still have uh, a handful of free copies. So if you've been being polite because you feel like you always get a copy, don't be polite. Just email me and I'll put you on the list. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for coming Nikki it's been so lovely to talk to you and see you and I can't wait for you have to come back for the next please, book please please thank you for having me it's been such good fun I'm a huge fan oh thank you uh you've been really brilliant thank you and thanks everybody um oh yeah they want you back you've got it so take that as an open invite <laughs> I'm coming <laughs> thank you everybody see you again good night <laughs> Take care, night-night.